Chapter Ten of In School and Out: The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: Richard Learns the Meaning of Right About Face. The apartment to which Richard was shown was called Barrack B. There were ten rooms of this kind, known by the first ten letters of the alphabet, omitting J. Each barrack contained twenty narrow iron bedsteads, and no two boys were allowed to occupy the same bed. At the head of each barrack there was an alcove large enough to contain the bed of the assistant teacher, who had charge of the pupils in the room. This apartment of the instructor was screened from the view of the boys by a curtain, so that he could see, without being seen, when he desired to do so. There was a small closet in the wall between every two beds for the use of the boys, and Richard was directed to transfer the contents of his trunk to this receptacle by Mr. Galt, the assistant teacher in charge of Barrack B. Richard opened the trunk and then sat down upon the bed to wait until the instructor should retire, for he did not care to exhibit his wardrobe to a stranger. Proceed, if you please, said Mr. Galt. I think I will do this business by myself," replied Richard. According to a rule of the Institute, the wardrobe of each pupil must be inspected," said the teacher. "Inspected?" asked the recruit. "What for?" "To see that no improper articles are brought in." "I would rather not," added Richard. "The rule is imperative," said Mr. Gault decidedly. The straitjacket had already begun to oppress the male heir of Woodville. And he was disposed to resent the indignity as he deemed it, but almost the last words of Bertha had been an injunction to observe the rules of the school, however distasteful they might be. Reluctantly, and with the feeling that he was sacrificing his independence, Richard transferred his clothing to the closet assigned to him. Mr. Galt carefully watched the proceeding and confiscated several articles which were declared to be contraband, among which were some cakes and other sweetmeats. Prepared by Bertha, and several yellow-covered novels he had purchased in Whitestone. Can't I have those things? Asked Richard. No, sir. No boy belonging to the institute is allowed to eat cake on the premises. Why not? We do not explain to boys the reason for everything we do," replied Mr. Galt rather curtly. I don't think you have any right to take my property away from me. I don't ask your opinion, and it is of no value whatever. You needn't be so crusty about it," said Richard, who was wholly unused to this style of remark. "We tolerate no impudence here. If you use an expression of that kind again, you will be put under arrest and spend the night in the guardhouse." Richard's blood was beginning to boil, and he was tempted to pitch into the insolent instructor who dared to use language of that kind to the only son of the proprietor of Woodville. But he did not want to get into trouble the first day. Besides, the words "arrest." And guardhouse had a very ominous sound to him. Can't I have my books? They are not cake," asked Richard. "No, sir, you cannot. Such trash as that is not fit for boys to read. Your property will be kept safely for you, and when you leave the school, you can have it again. The cake will not be very good then. You can do anything you please with it, except eat it. You can sell it or give it away. You can do what you like with it. Very well. Have you any money about you? I have. You will hand it to me, and a receipt for the amount will be forwarded to your father. Do you mean to rob me? Demanded Richard, his face flushing at this new indignity. I refer you to the regulations of the institute. We provide everything the boys require, and they have no more use for money than they have for wings. I won't give up my money. Very well, sir. I will refer the matter to Colonel Brockridge, and you may settle it with him. Follow me, if you please," said Mr. Galt, after Richard had locked the trunk containing the contraband articles. The new scholar followed the teacher to the office of the principal on the first floor. He was very uneasy and nervous, and almost wished he had given up his money. But he felt that the tutor was carrying things altogether too far; it was subjecting him to a needless indignity. This young man refuses to give up his money," said Mr. Galt to the Colonel, who was writing at his desk. Without waiting to ascertain the result of the interview, the assistant departed, leaving the obdurate youth alone with the owner of those terribly sharp eyes. "Have you read our regulations, Grant?" said Colonel Brockridge, turning round and looking the recruit full in the face. 
but there was a pleasant smile upon his face, and his words were gentle and even respectful. "'Yes, sir,' replied Richard. "'Then you are aware that pupils are not allowed to have money, are you not?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Boys are tempted to purchase various articles which injure them, such as cakes and candy and improper books. Therefore we think it is better that they should not be provided with money. Is this a satisfactory explanation?' "'I don't know, but it is, sir.' replied Richard doubtfully. It satisfies me at any rate. How much money have you? About five dollars. Now, Grant, if you will hand it to me, I will give you a receipt for it, or send it to your father. I will keep it, subject to your order, if you desire it. I don't like the rule, sir. I think it is an excellent rule, but you waste my time. Your decision, Grant. I should like to think of the matter, sir. Your decision at once, said the Colonel and Richard saw the sharp eyes grow a shade sharper, and heard the deep voice grow a shade sterner. The recruit winced under the necessity thus laid upon him. The principal could not be trifled with, and he must either submit or take the consequences, which were so indefinite to him that they seemed sufficiently terrible. "'I will give up the money,' said he with a struggle, as he handed his wallet to the colonel. "'I am glad to find you are a discreet and sensible youth,' added the colonel as he wrote the receipt and handed it with the wallet from which he had taken the money back to the owner if you wish to use money for any proper purpose you can draw on me and your paper shall be honored to the extent of the funds in my hands i don't think i am likely to want money here answered richard gloomily every needed article will be furnished now grant i am afraid you have come here with an intention to resist our wholesome regulations if so you must learn the meaning of right about face in its moral application i mean your father has told me all about you and given me explicit instructions to make a man of you i understand your case perfectly if you are disposed to observe the rules of the institute we shall treat you like a gentleman the future is before you young man and you must choose for yourself i intend to obey the rules sir said richard rather crestfallen after what had happened i am very glad to hear you say so in a few days you will be provided with the uniform worn by the pupils of the institute here is a time card for the fall term look it over carefully for you will be required to conform to it very strictly to-morrow morning you will take your place with the boys and go through with the program just as though you had been here all your lifetime we make no allowances for beginners they will have seasonable warning and they must be on the ground promptly at the moment there will be a dress parade in a few moments, and you can go out and witness it if you choose," said Colonel Brockridge, as he handed Richard the card. After supper, Mr. Galt will introduce you to the boys of your barrack. Richard took the card and left the room. As he passed out of the building, he described the boys at play on the lawn. They were all dressed in a uniform of gray cloth, though some wore a loose blouse, and some, in the heat of play, had thrown off their jackets. The new scholar walked over to the flagstaff, where the stars and stripes were flying, and seated himself on a bench. The boys seemed to be having a good time, in spite of the strictness of the discipline. As he listened to the tremendous noise they made, and saw the rough-and-tumble games in which they were engaged, he became convinced that the Institute was not of the Blimber style, and he began to have some hope that he should survive the shock. While he was waiting for the dress parade, he examined the time-card given him by the principal. To him it had a decidedly straight-jacket odor, and he read it with a feeling of repugnance, not to say disgust. It was as follows. Turnbrook Military Institute. Fall term. From September 1 to December 1. 6 a.m. Reveille. 6.30. Study. 7.30. Breakfast. 8. Squad drill. 9. Study and recitation. 11. Battalion drill. 1 p.m. Dinner. 1.30. Recreation. 3. Study and recitation. 5. Recreation. 6. Dress parade. 6.30. Supper. 7. Off time. 9. Retire. The off time belongs to the student, but deficient lessons must be made up during these hours. Camp duty will be performed by all students for one week in each term, except the winter term. J. Brockridge, Principal. Richard thought the time card was rather formidable, 
but he came to the conclusion that he could stand it if the rest of the boys could. While he was musing upon the present and the future, the rattling drum sounded, and the boys instantly suspended their play. In a moment the whole crowd had disappeared within the buildings that flanked the lawn. But presently the rattle of several drums was heard, and one company after another marched upon the parade ground and formed the line. Every boy was dressed in full uniform now, the blouses and other non-conforming garments having been thrown aside, and every one wore white gloves. Richard found that the teachers were not the officers of the companies, or the battalion as he had expected. Several of the instructors were present, but they appeared to take no part in the proceedings. Everything was managed by the boys, apparently without any assistance from the teachers. The captains, lieutenants, sergeants, and corporals were all in appropriate uniform, with their rank designated as in the United States Army. The swords and muskets were genuine weapons, though not so large and heavy as those used by older soldiers. The students varied in age from fourteen to eighteen. The various evolutions of the dress parade were regularly performed. The adjutant announced to the major that the parade was formed. The band, consisting of eight pieces, marched up and down the line. The first sergeants reported, All present or accounted for, and the company officers marched up to the commander of the battalion. The boys were as rigid as statues when the order, Parade Rest, was given. The companies marched back to the armories, broke ranks, and were dismissed. Richard was delighted with this exhibition and the Tunbrook Military Institute went up many degrees in his estimation. He followed the boys into the supper-room, where, without much ceremony, he made the acquaintance of several captains and lieutenants. He received a hearty welcome from his new associates, and began to feel very much at home. The supper was not exactly what he had been accustomed to at Woodville, but it was plain wholesome food and when he saw officers and privates from the major down to the drummers partake of it with hearty relish, he was not disposed to grumble. After supper the boys scattered in every direction. Some went outdoors, some to the barracks, and some to the schoolrooms. It was off time, and without much assistance from Mr. Galt, who attempted to introduce him, he made the acquaintance of half the students in the institute. At nine o'clock the sound of the drum rolled through the halls and the boys all retired. End of chapter 10 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 11 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Richard Goes Through the Drill and Has a Set To in the Grove Richard slept very well and was attending to the business of sleeping with great pertinacity, when the reveille sounded at six o'clock in the morning. He did not feel much like getting up, and though the other boys in Barrack B instantly jumped out of bed, he did not heed the summons. It went against his grain to get up at the sound of a drum or of a bell. Not that he cared to lie in bed any longer, but the principle of the thing was utterly objectionable. "'Come, Grant,' said the boy who occupied one of the beds next to him, in a kind and friendly tone. It's time to turn out. I suppose it is, yawned Richard, but I'm not quite ready to get up yet. Better get up at once. They call the roll to half-past six. You are in our company, you know. Suppose I don't get up. What then? It will be all the worse for you. What will they do? I don't know, but fellows don't like to be late at roll call. Richard concluded to get up for he preferred to see a punishment inflicted upon someone besides himself before he got into trouble. Bailey, for this was the name of the boy next to him, told him what to do and where to go, till they made their appearance at the armory of Company D, to which the recruit had been assigned. They were then sent to the schoolroom for an hour's study. Richard was examined to ascertain his attainments and placed in a class, and he was told to prepare himself for the lessons of the day. There was no great hardship in this, and as Richard's talents were of a high order, he had no difficulty in performing the work assigned to him. The breakfast call scattered the boys again, and they were soon reassembled in the dining-room. When they were seated, profound silence reigned throughout the apartment. The principal, all the assistant teachers, and every one else belonging to the establishment were present. 
The chaplain then read a short passage from the scriptures, which was followed by a prayer, the whole service occupying not more than three or four minutes. The breakfast consisted of coffee, beefsteak, potatoes with cold bread and butter. The newcomer was perfectly satisfied with his fare, and taking it as a sample of his living, did not believe he should starve. "'What next, Nevers?' asked Richard of the boy who sat next to him, and who wore the designation of an orderly sergeant. "'Squad drill, my boy. We shall give you some now,' replied Nevers. "'We begin to find out what a fellow is made of on drill.' There was a little spare time before the drill came on, and the new student improved it by inquiring particularly into the nature of his duties. Bailey was patient and communicative, and he obtained from him all the information he wanted. Again the drum rattled, and the boys made their way to the several armories. The doors and windows were thrown open, and the drill commenced. It was conducted by Mr. Galt, who was assisted by various officers of the company. "'Nevers,' said the assistant, "'you may take Grant and instruct him in the positions.' Richard glanced at the orderly sergeant to whom this command had been given, and the look of satisfaction which Nevers put on did not please him. "'This way, if you please, Grant,' said the young orderly sergeant, as he led the way to one corner of the armory. "'What are you going to do?' demanded the recruit. "'Give you the positions. Are you my teacher?' "'I am ordered to give you the positions,' replied Nevers, chuckling with a delight which the newcomer could not understand. "'You want to find out what I am made of, don't you?' said Richard, remembering what the other had said to him at breakfast. "'I always obey orders. Well, I think I should rather be instructed by the regular teachers.' "'Very well. I will report to Mr. Galt. "'You needn't trouble yourself. "'If this is the custom, go ahead. I am ready. "'Stand as I do, if you please. "'Heels on the same line. "'Feet turned out equally. "'Knees straight.' "'Richard observed all these instructions, "'and being a very tractable scholar, "'he was soon master of the positions. "'Eyes right,' continued Nevers, "'explaining the meaning of the order. "'Front!' There were three other boys who had not yet been supplied with uniforms, having come to the Institute a few days before. These also were placed in Nevers's care, and he began to drill them in the facings. "'Attention, squad,' said the drill-master, explaining what he meant, and going through with the next movement. "'Right face!' Richard did not come to time, and the sergeant repeated his instructions and gave the order again. But it was done no better than the first time. "'Move quicker, Grant!' How long will it take you to turn on your left heel? Now try again. Right face. The young gentleman from Woodville did not like the style of the drill master's remarks, though he had been scrupulously polite in all he had said. Up to the point of Richard's failure to obey the order with promptness, there was something in his tone and manner that was very offensive to him. Nevers seemed to feel that he was armed with authority, and he intended to make the newcomer feel it. But Richard took his own time and after they had tried half a dozen times he could not right face till after the others had completed the movement how long will it take you to turn on your heel grant said nevers sharply when his patience had been sorely tried till you speak a little more civilly replied richard quietly perhaps not till you have found out what i am made of nevers bit his lip at this reply perhaps he was conscious that he ought not to have used the remark or he might have reported the contumacy of the recruit to the assistant in charge of the room we will try again continued nevers right face the result was no better than before for richard was so offended at the manner of the instructor that he determined not to obey well grant you won't get round till the first day of january you are a perfect doughhead said nevers the last remark being in a low tone though it was distinctly heard by the subject of it all right muttered Richard. If you have found out what my head is made of, I will show you, by and by, what my fist is made of. Ready when you are, replied Nevers, dropping his voice so that the assistant teacher could not hear him. Now, about face, and he explained the movement, and went through with it himself. Richard, having made up his mind what to do with the occasion offered, did not deem it necessary to carry his resistance any farther at present. Besides, he was very desirous of learning the drill, that he might join the company. His about-face, therefore, was unexceptionable. "'Very well, Grant,' said the drill-master, in a satirical tone, and with a patronizing air. 
your praise and your censure are all the same to me spare me both if you please replied richard with a dignity becoming the male heir of woodville no impudence you puppy growled nevers his cheek flushed with anger if galt wasn't here i'd boot you i will make an opportunity for you when he is not present do your duty like a decent fellow if you can answered richard squad forward march said nevers as he explained how the command was to be executed as richard and his companions in the squad were very tractable scholars they soon mastered all the mysteries of the step in common time and were then instructed in the principles of the double quick they were then reviewed several times in what they had learned after which muskets were placed in their hands and they were taught to shoulder arms support arms and present arms the hour devoted to drill was finished and in spite of the overbearing manner of the instructor richard was pleased with the exercise and even began to entertain visions of military glory the two hours devoted to study and recitations passed off without anything to distinguish them richard had learned his lessons and everything went off to his satisfaction the next item on the time card was the battalion drill the recruits were placed in the ranks and for an hour and a half they were exercised in the school of the battalion part of the time by colonel brockridge and part of the time by the young gentleman who had been elected by the company officers to the command of the battalion major morgan if richard was pleased with the squad and company drill he was delighted with that of the battalion after dinner came the hour of recreation during this time the boys were allowed to go anywhere upon the estate which contained about a hundred acres of land some of them made up games on the parade ground and others went over to the grove a short distance from the institute buildings richard and bailey who had become good friends in the short time they had been acquainted took a walk over the estate they found the students engaged in every amusement which the genius of a boy could devise from baseball and cricket down to mud dams and water wheels in the grove they found nevers whom richard was very anxious to meet the orderly sergeant was a year older than richard and somewhat heavier there is the fellow i've been looking for said richard to his companion who nevers yes that's his name do you know him he drilled our squad this morning and took the trouble to insult me several times just like him he is the biggest bully in the school i am going to knock some of his impudence out of him you exclaimed bailey stopping short and looking with astonishment at the newcomer i'm going to try it at any rate added richard more modestly i don't let any fellow insult me why he will break every bone in your body he can lick any fellow in the school i don't care for that i won't be imposed upon by him but it won't do if any fellow gets up a fight here it goes hard with him can't help that but he will whip you as sure as you attempt it i tell you he is the bully of the school he called me a doughhead on drill this morning if you had reported him to mr galt he would have punished him severely no officer is allowed to speak impudently to a private especially to a new fellow why didn't you report him because i feel able to fight my own battles besides i don't like the idea of being a tell-tale i advise you not to touch him he will make mincemeat of you if you do perhaps he will he shall have a chance to try it i should like to see him licked and so would every other fellow in the school i think i can take care of him do you know anything about the science oh well something replied richard with assumed indifference but richard had been very thoroughly educated in the science of self-defense by bob bleeker who had served his time as a butcher's boy in new york city and done duty there as a rough of the first water nevers knows all about it he has had half a dozen pitched battles with fellows whom he bullied and all of them got whipped nevers has been cock of the walk for the last year for no fellow dares say a word to him richard said no more but went directly to the place where the bully was standing he walked up to him with a bold and defiant air i am glad to meet you nevers said he with easy self-possession are you my fighting chicken laughed nevers you called me a doughhead this morning added richard i did and to make sure that there is no mistake i repeat it you are a doughhead then take that for your impudence said richard as with a sudden movement he slapped the bully's face a fight a fight shouted the dozen boys who were gathered in that part of the grove 
"'What do you want, Grant?' demanded Nevers, turning pale and red with rage. "'Do you want me to lick you?' "'If you please. You wanted to know what I am made of. I am ready to show you.' "'Clear the ring!' shouted the boys, forming a circle round the two belligerents. Richard coolly threw off his jacket and vest, rolled up his shirt-sleeves, unloosed his suspenders, and wound them round his waist, to support his pants. Nevers threw off his jacket only. By this time, at least, fifty boys had assembled to witness the encounter, and so unpopular was the bully, that Richard had the sympathy of the whole crowd, except a few personal friends of his opponent. "'I am all ready,' said Richard, taking the most approved attitude. "'So am I,' replied the ready Nevers, as he edged up to Richard, and attempted to plant a blow by the side of his head, which was handsomely pareed, and a left hand rap lodged under the eye of the bully. This blow maddened Nevers, and he redoubled his efforts to crush his opponent, as he had expected to do at the first onset. Keep cool, and have both eyes open, had been the oft-repeated admonition of Richard's distinguished instructor in the sublime art of self-defense, and he carefully observed the instruction. After a few more plunges on the part of Nevers, he found himself on the ground from the effect of a stunning blow which Richard had given him on the side of the head. "'Are you satisfied?' called Richard, flushed with victory. "'No!' yelled Nevers, as he sprang to his feet, and rushed upon his antagonist. Richard's coolness enabled him to do wonders, and the bully was down again in a moment more. "'Come on, if you are not satisfied,' said Richard, whose nose was bleeding, and on whose face there was a huge swelling caused by the bully's hard fist." time shouted the boys galt's coming dry up settle it another time added others as they began to scatter end of chapter 11 recording by scarlet louisiana chapter 12 of in school and out the conquest of richard grant by oliver optic this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter Twelve, Richard does a big thing and takes the consequences. In the language of the prize ring, Nevers was still able to come to time. Therefore, Richard could not be regarded as the victor in the fierce contest. The boys who formed the ring began to scatter as soon as the coming of the assistant teacher was announced. But they helped the combatants to clothe themselves and used every effort in their power to conceal the fact that a fight had taken place. A drawn battle, said one of the students. Grant, said Nevers, I am far from being satisfied. At five o'clock, if you are ready, we will finish this business. With all my heart, replied Richard, wiping the blood from his nose. I hope you will do so, said the bully earnestly. You hope I will. Do you suppose I will not? I am willing to be put under bonds to appeal at the time named, Nevers. If anybody backs out, I shall not be the one. I am sure I shall not. Good, shouted the boys. Now, keep still, fellows, added Nevers. Don't say a word about it, or all the fun will be spoiled. The spectators of the barbarous spectacle all promised to keep still, and Richard moved over to a brook behind the grove to wash the blood from his face. His opponent had sun-dry, very bad-looking places on his physiognomy, but no blood had been drawn. By this time, Mr. Gault made his appearance in the grove, but so well did the boys play their parts that he did not even suspect that any unusual event had transpired. Some of them commenced a game of tag, and played with such zeal that no one could have suspected they were not in earnest. Others engaged in conversation, and those who had followed Richard to the brook resumed their labors upon the dam and water-wheel. Mr. Gault had no particular motive in visiting the grove. He was merely taking a walk in the discharge of his duty, which included a general supervision of the boys on all the grounds. But Richard kept out of his way, fearful lest his swelled face should betray him, and thus prevent the final settlement of the account. He felt like a victor already, for he was perfectly confident that his superior science and coolness would give him the battle. I am sorry to add that he did not think of the good resolutions he had made, or if he did, he banished the thought as inconvenient and uncomfortable. He really believed that he had been deeply injured by the bully of the Institute, and if he did not regard it 
as a positive duty to obtain satisfaction, he at least felt that such a course was perfectly justifiable. Nevers was the bully of the school. Weak and timid boys were obliged to submit to his insults. He had won the position of the best man in the school, and he employed his power in playing the tyrant. Richard felt that he must either whip him or acknowledge him as his superior and submit to his rule. The element of pride also had a powerful influence upon his mind. Bailey had told him that Nevers could whip any fellow in the Institute, and it followed, of course, if he could master him, he should at once become the champion of the ring. Richard regarded this as a proud distinction, and he was quite willing to have a battered nose and a swelled face in the achievement of such an honor. More than all this, Richard was animated by the generous sentiment that, in fighting and whipping the bully of the ring, he became the champion of the weak and the timid, who dared not resent the insolent of Nevers. When he washed his face and stopped the bleeding, he followed the course of the brook till it emptied itself into the river, which was a small stream some four or five rods wide. He was attended by Bailey and two or three other boys, who had suddenly conceived a very great admiration for him. If he was not the victor in the fight, he had the advantage, and he had already partially entered upon the enjoyment of the honors which would be bestowed upon the conqueror of Nevers. A short distance, above the mouth of the brook, the river received the waters of the beautiful and picturesque Tunbrook Lake. The Institute grounds bordered upon it for some distance, and great was the satisfaction of Richard when he saw several boats which his companions informed him belonged to the school. There was a large schooner-rigged sailboat, two twelve-oar race-boats, besides three smaller craft. He felt at home here, and inquired particularly whether the boys were allowed to use these boats. They were only permitted to sail in company with some of the instructors. The boys were exercised in rowing on Saturday afternoons, when the regular sessions of the school were suspended, and also upon the occasional holidays which were granted. The lake was seven miles long, by about two in breadth, so that there was abundant sea-room. While they were examining the boats and viewing the beautiful lake, the signal bell in the tower of the Institute's schoolroom sounded its warning peal, and summoned them to study and recitation. "'How does my face look, Bailey?' "'Not very bad.' "'Do you think Gaunt will smell a mice when he hears my lessons?' "'I don't see why he should.' "'I guess I can stave him off if he does,' added Richard confidently. "'Didn't you see me tumble down when that fellow chased me?' "'What fellow?' asked Bailey. "'Any fellow you please,' replied Richard, with a knowing smile. "'I didn't see any fellow chase you,' added Bailey. "'Can't you see through a millstone when there is a hole in it?' "'Of course I can. "'Don't you see what I mean?' "'No, I don't. "'If Galt asks me how I hurt my face, "'I will tell him a fellow was chasing me and I tumbled down. "'Of course all the rest of you saw it.' "'But I don't see it,' persisted Bailey. "'Don't you, indeed? "'Then I think you ought to have a pair of leather spectacles.' "'Oh, I know what you mean, but I don't believe in lying about it.' "'Ah, then you are a military saint, are you?' said Richard, with a sneer. "'All but the saint,' laughed Bailey. "'I don't think there is any use in lying about it. "'Then I suppose you think it was very wicked of me to fight with Nevers.' "'No, I don't,' answered Bailey, promptly and decidedly. "'Nevers is a bully, and he insulted you. "'My father always told me never to take an insult, "'but he would thrash me for telling a lie.' "'Well, Bailey, I believe you are right. "'I think it is mean to tell a lie.' but how shall I manage it? Face the music. A fellow who can stand such a pounding as you have had wouldn't mind being punished. I don't like to be punished. I don't know as the colonel would punish you. If a fellow gets up a fight, he has to take it. But if he only defends himself, he says he does no more than his duty. Well, who got up this fight? That's the point. Nevers insulted you, and you pitched into him. I don't know which is most to blame." We will leave it to the powers that be, and not bother our heads about the question. I won't lie about it anyhow. By the time this point was settled, the boys had reached the schoolroom. Richard applied himself with zeal and patience to the labors of the afternoon, determined to do his whole duty. When called out to recite, Mr. Galt noticed the swelling upon his face, and at recess asked him what had caused it. It was done in a little affair out in the grove, sir, replied Richard. What kind of affair? "'Nevers and I had a little set to,' said Richard. 
rather rough play, I should think, added Mr. Galt, as he struck the bell for the work to be resumed. Richard congratulated himself that he had escaped, and, as he thought, without telling a lie. He told none with his lips, but his manner was such as to assure the teacher that the affair in the grove had been nothing but friendly sport. Deception, or willful misleading another, for the accomplishment of a purpose, is, in our opinion, just as culpable a falsehood as gaining the same end by a lie expressed in words. But Richard had not come up to this standard. At the close of the school session, Richard hastened to the grove, as did all the boys who were in the secret of the fight. Nevers was on the ground soon after him, and the arrangements for the fight were hastily completed. A line of scouts reaching from the parade ground to the grove was stationed at convenient distances to give warning of the approach of any of the teachers. The ring was formed, and Richard coolly divested himself of all superfluous clothing, and prepared with the utmost care for the desperate encounter. Nevers was ready sooner than Richard for he was not so precise in the arrangement of his garments. As he took his place in the ring, though he stood strong and defiant, there was a kind of nervousness in his manner which might have been detected by a keen observer. "'Come, Grant, we shall not get to work to-day if you don't hurry up,' said Nevers, his lip curling into a sneer. But it was the bully in him that spoke. He had a reputation to sustain, and he was saying and doing all he could to ward off any imputation upon his courage. "'In one moment, Nevers,' added Richard. "'You are as particular as though you were going to a ball,' continued Nevers. "'I suppose you are too much of a man to ball whatever happens, so there won't be any,' replied Richard. "'We shall have the Colonel and all the teachers down upon us if you don't get fixed soon.' "'I'm all ready,' said Richard, throwing himself into the attitude of the pugilist. "'Come on, then.' Richard edged up to his antagonist, and after considerable sparring the fight commenced in good earnest. Nevers was too much excited to use all his strength to the best advantage, for the first hit he received seemed to make him angry. In the first round Richard had the advantage. In the second Nevers knocked him down, but he was not at all disconcerted. The heavy blows he received did not appear to disturb his equanimity while his opponent worked himself up into a towering passion. The fight went on for ten minutes without varying results. At one time all the spectators were sure that Nevers would win, and at another they were equally sure that Grant would be the victor. The anger of Nevers exhausted him more than his tremendous efforts. Both parties had been terribly punished, but Richard was still cool and self-possessed. At last Nevers became desperate and rushed upon his foe, determined at one effort to crush him. He was furious and abandoned all the science he had brought to his aid, and apparently depended entirely upon brute force. The consequence was that he laid himself open to his cool rival, and Richard rained a series of tremendous blows upon his head, which carried him under. He fell heavily upon the ground, and lay there incapable of moving. Richard, though his nose was bleeding, and he could not see out of one eye, seated himself on the ground for a moment, till he had recovered his breath, and then took his place in the ring. "'Time!' cried the friends of Richard. But Nevers could not come to time. He raised himself partly up, but sank back again, incapable of making the effort to rise. "'Come on,' said Richard, as he sparred a little with his fists to assure the spectators that he was game to the last." Nevers made no reply, and Richard was declared the victor by his own friends, and the proposition was admitted by those of his prostrate antagonist. "'I am satisfied,' added Richard, as he picked up his clothes and made his way down to the brook, attended by an admiring crowd. When Nevers recovered his breath, he rose from the ground, and his companions helped him down to the water, where he was bathed by his sympathizing friends. Both of the combatants were severely though not seriously injured. "'What's to be done now, fellows?' asked Richard, when all that cold water could do for him had been done. "'I suppose we are all in a bad scrape.' "'That's so,' replied several. "'We will stand by you, Grant, as well as we can.' "'I am not exactly in condition to appear at dress parade,' added Richard, turning his head round, so as to bring his available eye to bear upon his companions. 
You are better off than Nevers, who is first sergeant of Company D. Can't we keep out of sight till we get our eyes open, as little kittens do? Roll call before dress parade, suggested Bailey. Can't some fellow answer for me? I will spend the night in the cabin of the sailboat on the lake. It won't be the first time I'd slept in a boat. That won't do. Better face the music, Grant. But I shall be punished for this affair. I don't— Colonel Brockridge is coming, was the word passed down the line of scouts, interrupting Richard's remarks on the subject of punishment. What shall I do? Don't do anything, Grant, said Bailey. You are sure to be found out, whatever you do. If you run away, it will be all the worse for you. Richard, after a moment's reflection, was of the same opinion, and he decided to take the consequences, whatever they might be. "'What does all this mean?' demanded the colonel, sternly, when he saw the swelled face of Richard. "'Been a fight, sir,' replied several of the boys. "'Between whom?' "'Nevers and Grant.' "'Nevers and Grant will report forthwith in my office,' said the principal, as he walked back to the Institute. End of Chapter 12 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 13 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Richard Listens to a Homily on Fighting and Spends the Night in the Guard House. Richard, in obedience to the order of the principal, immediately repaired to the office, where he was soon joined by Nevers, both of them very much the worse for the encounter. "'You have been fighting, have you, young gentlemen?' demanded Colonel Brockridge, as he entered the room. "'You know the rules of the Institute, Nevers,' added the principal sternly. "'I do, sir, but I was struck, and was obliged to fight in self-defense. "'And you, Grant, had common sense enough to know better than to engage in a fight. "'You struck the first blow, did you?' "'I struck the first blow that was given with the fist, but Nevers struck the heaviest blow with his tongue. "'Explain, Grant.' At breakfast, I was informed by Nevers that they found out what boys were made of on drill. Did you make use of this remark, Nevers? asked the principal. I did, sir. What did you mean by it? Simply that we found out something about a boy's capacity. Ah, indeed, added Colonel Brockridge, in a slightly satirical tone. What did you understand by the remark, Grant? That a fellow who hadn't spunk enough to protect himself— must submit to be insulted and to be bullied by those who were wiser than he in military matters. "'I did not mean that, sir,' protested Nevers. "'His looks and his tone indicated it,' said Richard, and when he was directed to instruct me in the positions, his tone and manner were haughty and domineering. I so understood it, sir. If I am wrong, I am willing to apologize. In the course of the drill, he called me a doughhead. "'Is this true, Nevers?' "'It is.' but I did not call him so till I was satisfied he did not mean to observe the order. In teaching him the facings, he would not come about till all the others had finished the movement. I wouldn't if I had been in his place, added the colonel, very much to the astonishment of Richard, and very much to the indignation of Nevers. You know very well that one boy is never permitted in this school to domineer over another. You took pains beforehand to inform Grant, by your words, and especially by your looks and actions, that you meant to haze him, to bully him. As a decent boy, he could not submit to it. Then you called him a doughhead, which, as Grant suggests, was the heaviest blow that was struck, for it touches a spot which the fist cannot reach. Nevers, you commenced the fight. I think not, sir. We don't argue the matter, sir, said the colonel sharply. One thing more. No pupil is allowed to use ungentlemanly language to another pupil. Obedience to officers, who are merely students, is purely voluntary. If a boy refuses to obey the officers, he must leave the company. No boy is compelled to go into the ranks. On drill, the case is still stronger, Nevers. If the recruit will not obey, it is the duty of the drill officer to report him to the instructor. If you had done so, it would have been Mr. Gault's duty to drill Grant himself. Nevers made no reply to these remarks. He cast a savage glance at Richard, who appeared to have conquered him in the forum as well as in the field. "'Grant, you are also to blame,' continued the principal. "'We will not permit you to be insulted, bullied, or domineered over. I will protect you, but you must not take the law into your own hands. 
a blow is not justifiable except in self-defense, or when all other means have failed. You knew it was wrong to strike Nevers. I did not think so at the time, sir, replied Richard. What you have said has changed my view of the matter. Nevers sneered at this remark of his antagonist, and Richard saw and felt that sneer. It was as much as to say that he, Richard, was making his peace with the principal by pretending a penitence he did not feel. It stung him where he was very sensitive, and he was angry. While his wrath was boiling, and he was considering in what manner he should punish his crestfallen rival for his savage look and his bitter sneer, the parting admonition of Bertha came to his mind, with a promise that he had made to obey the rules of the school. This suggested his big resolutions to reform his life and character. A brutal fight on the first day of his residence at Tunbrook was not exactly redeeming his solemn promise to his sister, nor was the conquest of Nevers a step towards the conquest of himself. Yet, in spite of his promise, and in spite of his resolutions, he could not believe that he had been altogether in the wrong. He thought Colonel Brockridge's views of the case were very sensible, and while he wished he had not been so hasty in hitting Nevers, he felt, as the principal had suggested, that his conduct was greatly palated by the provocation he had received. Nevers cast looks of hatred and contempt at him, which stirred his blood deeper than even the words of insults he had received. He came to the conclusion that the bully had not got enough yet, and impulsively he determined to give him some more at the first convenient opportunity. But when he thought of the promise he had made to Bertha, when he thought of his resolution to conquer himself, he struggled with the temptation, and finally had the strength to say to the malignant demon of hatred and revenge, Get thee behind me, Satan. The victory was won. The heart of Richard was at peace. He had actually conquered himself this time. You have both done wrong, said the principal, after a few moments' consideration, during which time Richard had won a greater and nobler victory than that he had gained in the grove. I am sorry for it, said Richard, and it was almost the first time in his life that he had acknowledged himself in the wrong. Nevers cast a look full of contempt at him when he uttered these words, but Richard under the influence of the good angel which had taken possession of his soul, did not permit the look to ruffle him. "'I will do right, and feel right this time, if I never did before,' said he to himself. "'Nevers,' added the principal, "'your warrant as orderly sergeant is withdrawn. You are reduced to the ranks. You can go now. Remove those stripes from your arms.' The sentence was a heavy blow to the bully. For a year he had been trying to obtain promotion— he wanted a commission. The company officers were elected from the sergeants, and he was confident that he should be chosen captain of Company D at the next election. He had been a sergeant for a year and a half, and would have been a captain if he had not been a bully, for there were enough who disliked him on this account to prevent his election. As the first sergeant of the company, he was almost sure that he should be chosen the next time, but his sentence removed all hope of such preferment. Grant I believe you are sincerely sorry for what has happened, but you have done wrong, and you must be punished. Richard's anger rose at these words, and he was disposed to resent the idea of being punished for what he had done, especially after the judge had ruled so decidedly in his favor. I shall order you to be placed under arrest, and to spend the night in the guardhouse. You will report to me at dress parade. You can go. The culprit's lips were compressed, and his teeth were tightly closed. He was angry, for he had expected to be fully justified before the boys for his conduct. An impudent remark trembled on the end of his tongue, but the memory of the conquest he had achieved over himself prevented him from uttering it. "'I have done wrong, and I have owned that I was in the wrong. I will submit,' said Richard to himself as he left the office. When he went out upon the playground, he found the boys assembled in groups discussing the exciting event of the day. They gathered around him to learn the result of the trial. "'Nevers has lost his office, and I am under arrest, to spend the night in the guardhouse,' replied Richard, in answer to their inquiries. "'You got off easy,' said Bailey. "'I suppose I did. At any rate, I am satisfied.' "'Nevers has lost his warrant,' exclaimed the boys, who were particularly technical in speaking of military events. "'Let's give three cheers.' 
Don't do it, said Richard. It's a hard case for him. I am glad of it. The bully is down, added one. You licked him well, said another. I am sorry I did, replied Richard. I didn't understand the matter so well then as I do now. Colonel Brockridge is a trump. If any of Richard's friends at Woodville had heard this remark, they would have been ready to canonize him at once, for it was so utterly at variance with his style that his acquaintances would not have recognized it as coming from him. But Richard was engaged in the conquest of himself, and had won two or three important victories. The early call for dress parade sounded, and the boys all hastened to the armories to prepare for it. As Richard had no uniform yet, he was excused from serving and reported himself to the colonel, as he had been ordered. When the parade was finished, the principal delivered a homily on fighting, stating the facts connected with the combat of that day, and commenting upon them. He condemned fighting in round terms, declaring it was never necessary, except in self-defense. The civil and the social law would protect every member of the community, and there could be no need of resorting to the barbarous custom of settling differences by single combat. He applied the principles he laid down to the case before him so clearly that Richard lost much of his admiration of the noble art of self-defense, as pugilists stupidly style the act of fighting, to ascertain who is the better man. Lest our boy friends should not fully understand us, we must add that the colonel's views are ours. A boy ought to fight in self-defense, never to find out which is the better man. He should use no more violence than is necessary to defend himself. A boy is bound to protect his weak friend, not from words, but from blows, to the best of his ability, by using blows when they are necessary. We can excuse, but we cannot justify, the boy who strikes another for insulting his mother or his sister. We believe in a kiss for a blow, but we also believe that cannon are often the best peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, but he who permits himself to be unjustly scourged is more truly a fomenter of strife than he who conquers a peace in a good cause by the might of his strong arm. At the conclusion of his remarks, Colonel Brockridge ordered Richard to be conducted to the guardhouse, where he was to spend the night. Mr. Galt was directed to see the order executed, and the culprit was marched to the apartment which served as a place for confinement for offenders. He submitted to the punishment with the best grace he could command, but he was mortified and humiliated. The guardhouse was a bugbear to the boys of the Institute. It was a small room with a mockery of iron bars at the window, placed there more for effect than for anything else. It contained a bed and a stool with no other furniture, but it was regarded as a terrible place by the boys, not that it was a very great hardship to spend a night there but because of the disgrace which the popular sentiment of the establishment had attached to the prison. Richard entered, and the door was locked upon him. The room was dark, but he was not permitted to have a light. He seated himself upon the stool, and it was literally the stool of repentance to him. His supper was brought to him, and the servant stood by with a lamp till he had eaten it. He was then left alone for the night, to meditate upon the folly and wickedness of engaging in a fight without justifiable cause. One of the first questions which the hero of the fight asked himself was, whether he had not too tamely submitted to the authority which had humiliated and punished him. That he had done so was the most surprising thing he had ever known himself to do, and when he came to ask himself why he had submitted, he could very clearly trace the reason to the good resolution he had made to reform his life and character, to conquer himself. It was hard for him to give in, but he was satisfied with himself, and began to feel that he had really made some progress in the great work. He wanted to write a letter to Bertha, and tell her all about the events of the day, how patiently he had submitted to reproof and punishment, and record his solemn determination to conquer himself. He had no light, and no materials for writing. So, at an early hour, he went to bed, and fatigued with the labors and excitement of the day, he forgot in sleep that he was a prisoner. At Reveille in the morning, he was discharged from arrest, and ordered to report for duty in the schoolroom. He was still strong in his good resolutions, 
and the sneers and frowns of Nevers and his clique did not disturb him, did not even tempt him to indulge in the cheap retaliation of sneers and frowns in return. In the course of the day, Richard found that he was a lion. He had thrashed the bully of the school, and won the enviable position of champion of the Institute. But even this glory did not seem to be worth much, for since the fight, he realized that he had whipped a bigger fellow than Nevers. For a week, in school and out, Richard was true to himself, and behaved nobly. More times than we have room to record, during this period, he got the better of his ever-familiar foe, and every new victory improved his morale, and added to his prestige. At this point in his school career, the students were ordered to perform the usual round of camp duty, and at eight o'clock in the morning the battalion took up the line of march for the appointed place, at the other end of Tunbrook Lake, distant ten miles by the road. End of chapter 13 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 14 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Richard Does Guard Duty and is Captured by an Enemy Camping out was a great event at Tunbrook, and the students looked forward to it with pleasant anticipations for weeks. The principal was shrewd in his policy, and no one knew when it would take place till it was announced, only a day or two before the march. By this plan, he prevented any diversion of the thoughts from the lessons. Neither did the boys know where they were going when they started. They obeyed the orders which were given from time to time, and even when they halted for the night and pitched their tents, they could not find out whether they had reached the end of the march or not. The colonel told them that soldiers should be taught to obey orders and cured of all propensity to ask questions. The tour of camp duty for the summer term had been almost a continuous march, and during the campaign of ten days they had traveled over a hundred miles. Colonel Brockridge was an earnest believer in the necessity of physical development in boys. He was of the opinion that they could stand almost everything if they were regularly and systematically inured to hardship. Weak papas and tender mamas raised their hands with horror at the idea of having their Johnny sleep on the ground in a tent and stick to the camp whether it was fair weather or foul. But the colonel could adduce hundreds of instances where boys of puny constitutions had become strong and vigorous under this treatment. He believed that more boys had been spoiled by being babied than ever had been injured in the slightest degree by hardship, if military duty, as it was performed at Tunbrick, could be called hardship. It was very certain that the boys enjoyed camping out, and if a few of them sneezed or coughed after their return, these were not regarded as fatal symptoms. Richard was in his element when the school was put upon its muscle though nothing but a private in Company D, and subject to the orders of his inferiors in body and mind, he performed his duty cheerfully, and enjoyed it very much. After Nevers had been cured of his folly, there was not another boy in the establishment who had the hardihood or the desire to impose upon him. Everything was done with military order and precision on the morning that the battalion were marched from the Institute though the reader knows where they were going, not an officer or a private had a suspicion of their destination, and none but a few of the newcomers asked the question or appeared to care. In front of the battalion was the band, and behind it came the wagons containing the tents, baggage, and pontoon train. The principal and the instructors were scattered along the line, where they could superintend the operations of the column. Major Morgan, in command of the battalion, had evidently received instructions for a portion of the day, for, without any direction from the teachers, he led his command over the road to the grove, and in fifteen minutes after they started, the order to halt was given. The battalion stood rigid as a stake where they were ordered, and presently the engineer corps was detached for duty. 
the pontoon wagon was brought up and unloaded by the side of the river the boats which were of rubber were inflated and the business of building a bridge across the stream was commenced everything was so nicely prepared that the work was accomplished in an incredibly short space of time the battalion followed by its wagons crossed the pontoon bridge the boats and the planks were taken up and loaded upon the wagon again and the troops were ready to march neither colonel brockridge nor any of the instructors had spoken a word during these operations for the engineers had been thoroughly trained in their difficult duty for an hour the battalion marched without stopping the orders shoulder arms support arms right shoulder shift relieved them occasionally but some legs began to ache before a halt was permitted during the next hour they marched most of the way with the route step at twelve o'clock they halted for dinner and an hour's rest the haversacks of the soldiers had been filled with crackers and cold ham and they had a jolly dinner in a grove where they stopped about four o'clock in the afternoon they reached the upper end of the lake and the orders necessary for forming a camp were given the tents were pitched the boundaries of the camp marked out and a detail for guard duty was made from each company everything proceeded precisely as it would if they had been old soldiers and engaged in the actual business of war Richard was one of those who had been detailed from Company D for guard duty. The camp ground was a large open plain bordering on one side upon a dense forest. The night was dark and dismal, and at nine o'clock Richard found himself walking his lonely beat on the verge of the forest. There was a novelty about the situation that was very attractive to him, and as he walked his solitary round he actually enjoyed it. It was not to all probable that an enemy, or even a straggler, would disturb the quiet of the scene by attempting to pass the line. But though the guard had been commanded to be vigilant, he had abundant time and opportunity for reflection and castle-building. Our sentinel had imbibed much of the spirit of the soldier from the martial exercise to which he had been trained, and he indulged in some pretty visions of military glory. They were very pleasant and very alluring at that time, when the country was enjoying profound peace. Even the politicians, who were compromising with difficulties, present and future, never dreamed that the war blast would sound through the land in their day and generation, and were unbelievers in the dire prophecies which they uttered. While Richard's fancy led him to scenes of blood and glory on the battlefield, he little thought that an opportunity would so soon be presented for the practical application of his military knowledge and for the indulgence of his military ambition while he was dreaming of war and glory while in imagination he was leading battalions of brave men to battle and victory his reflections were disturbed by the approach of a squad of boys it was so dark that he did not see them till they were within a few rods of him it was evident that they had left the tents by stealth and must have crept some portion of the way on the ground to escape observation when they came near enough to be challenged the guard called out who comes there friends replied one of the party advance one friend and give the countersign one of them stepped forward and richard held him at bay with his bayonet according to military custom i declare i have forgotten the countersign said he then i will call the corporal of the guard no hold on a minute i shall think of it in a moment richard was willing to give him a fair chance as there was no enemy in the vicinity who could possibly intend to capture the battalion but while he was waiting the fellow suddenly grasped his musket and attempted to wrest it from his hands but this was a game at which two could play as well as one and richard instead of giving the alarm as he should have done threw himself upon his muscle and attempted to beat off his assailants the rest of the party immediately came to the assistance of the fellow and after a short but sharp struggle the sentinel was overpowered and his gun taken from him at the conclusion of the struggle richard found himself upon his back on the ground held down by the whole squad of boys or as many as could get hold of him one of them held a handkerchief over his mouth so that he could not give the alarm now that he found it necessary to do so 
Richard supposed this rough treatment could be nothing more than a practical joke, one of those tricks played off upon raw recruits to teach them the necessity of vigilance, and a nice observe of the rules of the service. When he was overpowered, therefore, he submitted to his fate, whatever it might prove to be, hoping his captors would relax their hold upon him just long enough to enable him to turn the tables upon them, for he was vain enough to believe that he could whip the whole dozen of them, if he could only have fair play. "'Let him up now, and we will tie his hands behind him,' said one of the party in a fiend voice, to prevent the victim from recognizing the speaker. "'But he will halloo if we let him up,' replied the one who had answered his challenge, and whose voice Richard could not identify. "'I'll stop his mouth if he halloos,' added the first speaker. "'I'll hit him over the head with the butt of his musket.' "'No, no,' said the other. "'You'll kill him. We don't want to injure him. I do. I wouldn't mind cracking his skull for him.' "'No, no. We shall get into trouble ourselves if we do anything of that kind.' Richard thought they would anyway, as soon as he could obtain the use of his arms. He felt so well qualified to take care of himself that he would have been willing to give his bond not to halloo, or call any one to his assistance, though he could not help wondering that the sentinels, whose beats were next to his own, did not arrive at the scene of operations. It was evident to him that they were asleep on their posts or that they were accomplices of the conspirators. "'Now, get up,' said the speaker, who used the disguised voice. Richard promptly obeyed this order, and though several of the boys held on to him as he rose, a terrible struggle ensued, in which the captured sentinel almost made good his mental boast. But they were too many for him, and his hands were tied behind him with a knapsack strap, in spite of his best exertions to shake them off. I told you he would be a hard customer, said one, who had not before spoken. Shut up, you ninny. You'll blow the whole of us. No fellow is to speak but you know whom, said he with the assumed voice. Richard tried to obtain, in the thick darkness that shrouded them, some clue which would enable him to identify the ruffians. But he could not make out anything particular in their form or motions to guide him and he was equally at fault in regard to the voices. He stood quiet when he found that resistance was useless, but he determined to keep a sharp lookout for an opportunity to release himself from his mortifying situation. Now, you. My name is Dobbin, added the false voice. Richard did not remember any such name, though he had heard the roll called in all the companies, and he concluded that it was a blind to deceive him. Now, Dobbin, Take him off, and we will settle the case in the woods. Lead the way, Kennedy, and we will follow, but be careful and not make a noise. Hush, said Dobbin. Somebody is coming. Grand rounds, added Kennedy. Hurry him off as quick as you can. Stuck the handkerchief in his mouth. Choke him if he attempts to cry out. But they will miss him, suggested Dobbin, and then there will be a row and a search. Off with him. Off with him. We shall all get caught, whispered Kennedy. I will take his gun and keep guard. Richard was literally dragged from the spot, and the fellow who called himself Kennedy, though that was not his name, took the musket of the defeated sentinel and began to travel his beat as regularly as though he had been duly detailed. Who comes there? demanded he, as the officer of the day, attended by a sergeant and two men, approached his beat. Grand rounds, replied the sergeant. Halt, grand rounds. Advance, sergeant, with the countersign. The sergeant advanced to give the countersign, without discovering that he had been challenged by the wrong man. Bennington, said the sergeant, giving the word appointed for the night. Advance rounds, added Kennedy, as he placed himself in the proper position. The officer of the day passed on with his attendants, and as soon as the ceremony had been repeated with the next sentinel, Kennedy threw the musket upon the ground and followed his companions into the forest. Taking a road which led into the wood, he soon overtook the rest of the party. Richard was very curious to find out what his captors intended to do with him, for he could not even yet believe that anything more serious than a practical joke was intended. He was not conscious that he had an enemy in the battalion, with the exception of Nevers, who— though he had bestowed a great many sneers and looks of hatred upon him during the week that had elapsed since the fight, had betrayed no intention to seek revenge for his defeat in fair fight. 
he knew that nevers hated him but he could not believe that he would resort to such underhand measures as the conspirators had adopted what are you going to do asked he after kennedy had joined them shut up you will find out soon enough richard tried to open a conversation with them but they were too wary to talk and no one spoke except dobbin and kennedy they conducted their prisoner half a mile as he judged from the camp when they halted and fastened richard to a tree seating themselves upon logs and stumps the captive waited impatiently for the proceedings to commence End of chapter fourteen recording by scarlet louisiana chapter fifteen of in school and out the conquest of richard grant by oliver optic this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen richard finds himself in the hands of the regulators come fellows we have no time to spare said kennedy when the party were seated and richard fastened to the tree we must finish this business at once we are all ready replied dobbin ready for what demanded richard ready to settle your case we are going to give you the biggest licking you ever had in your life the prisoner thought this was rather doubtful but as they could not be supposed to have any knowledge of the thrashing inflicted upon him by old batterbones he was willing to excuse any exaggerations of which they might be guilty when the young ruffian spoke of flogging him richard could not help recalling the incident at the barn of the farmer on the hudson then he was guilty now he was innocent and his feelings on the present occasion were as different from those of the former one as light is from darkness he had been captured while in the discharge of his duty and was not conscious that he had given his assailants any cause of offence he could not explain how it happened that he was not angry he did not chafe in the bonds that confined him the consciousness of being innocent of all offence before his comrades sustained and supported him and he felt a kind of proud superiority over his captors which placed him out of the reach of fear and even out of the reach of malice and revenge richard was a courageous boy he had been so in his foolish and vicious enterprises but he was doubly so now when his soul was free from the stain of transgression he did not borrow any trouble about what his persecutors intended to do though he felt a very natural curiosity to see the end of the adventure go on replied richard calmly as the spokesman of the party announced their intentions shall we tell him what far shall we try him asked kennedy yes let us give him a drumhead court-martial the licking won't do him any good if he don't know what it is for replied dobbin grant said kennedy with the solemnity of a judge you have ruined the best fellow in company d he ruined himself replied richard no he didn't of what you did in fair fight in the grove we haven't a word to say but you have prejudiced the colonel against him and caused him to be deprived of his warrant which will prevent him from obtaining his commission at the next election you set yourself up as a leader among the fellows before you had been a week in the school have you anything to say nothing except that all your charges are false answered richard and if there had been light enough to see it a smile would have been discovered upon his countenance in the interview with the principal you pretended to be a saint and to be sorry for what you had done you did not stand up like a man and take the consequences of your acts go on i have nothing to say added richard when the speaker paused you are a dangerous fellow in the school you intend to climb up yourself by pushing others down we won't submit to it what are you going to do coolly asked the prisoner we are going to thrash you as you deserve you are brave fellows sneered richard what you are afraid to do in the daylight with fair play you do by stealth and trickery in the night you are a set of cowards and if you will untie my hands i will whip the whole of you that is very fine talk grant said kennedy but it don't amount to anything no talk is necessary to prove your cowardly meanness go on and do your best i am not afraid of the whole of you even with my hands tied behind me i despise the whole of you we will give you a chance to escape 
I don't ask any chance to escape. Grant, you talk like a fool. Better be a fool than a knave and a coward. We don't want to hurt you. There are fellows enough in our crowd to make Tunbrook Institute too hot to hold you. We advise you to write to your father, advising him to send you to some other school. Will you do so? I will not, replied Richard promptly. Then you must take the consequences. We are organized, and we are determined that you shall leave. If you ask your father, and insist upon it, no doubt he will take you away. Very likely he would, added Richard, but I shall not ask him to do so. You plainly don't understand what is in store for you. Our plans are well laid, and we have been through the same mill once before. A fellow about your size, and one who could fight as well as you do, had to leave about a year ago. He undertook to be a leader before his time came. We hunted him out, as we shall you. When you hunt me out, I will go, but not till then. Grant, this is all idle talk on your part. You don't understand your situation. We can count up fifty fellows belonging to our association. We can drive out any fellow who makes himself obnoxious. We mean to be fair, and we are willing that any fellow who works his way up should have all the honors he wins. But do you suppose we fellows, who have been here two or three years, and who have worked ourselves up, are going to step one side for a fellow who has been here only a week or two? "'Who asks you to step aside?' demanded Richard indignantly, for this show of fair play had touched him in a tender spot, and in spite of himself he began to be interested in the argument. "'You do. You have licked the best fellow in the school, and then you begin to play saint and curry favor with the colonel. You mean to lead and not follow.' "'I mean to be and do just what circumstances require. "'Grant, there is no such thing as misunderstanding your position.' What your looks indicate is more than all you may say with your mouth, or do with your hands. You are a dangerous fellow, and you must leave or compromise. What do you mean by compromise? We'll let you stay if you will keep in your proper position. What is my proper position? At the foot of the ladder, of course, till the fellows above you have got out of the way. You mean nevers. Nevers and others. I will agree to no such compromise. All the officers, I am informed, are chosen by ballot. They are. Then, of course, the fellows can choose whom they please. They can, and since you have whipped nevers, they will elect you, and those who have done their duty for two or three years must go into the shade. If you will agree to step one side, we will promise to let you alone. Will you do it? I will not. Mind what you do, for if the regulators make war upon you, they will drive you out. The what? The regulators. They are a secret society for certain purposes. It is a powerful organization, Grant, I can tell you. If you will do the right thing, we will take you in. No, you won't. I'm not to be taken in by any such bait, replied Richard, who was disposed to laugh at the ridiculous association that had taken upon itself the duty of regulating the affairs of the Tunbrook Institute. You may sneer as much as you please. Every fellow in the school knows there is such a society, but no one but members can tell who belong to it. We mean to have fair play in this institution, and we have never yet failed in getting it. Come, Kennedy, you will talk all night, said Dobbin. You can't do anything with him. Well, Grant, you may leave. Compromise, or take the consequences. Which will you do? I will not leave, and I certainly will not compromise on the terms named. I mean to behave myself like a man while I am here. If any one is a better fellow than I am, I will step one side for him, as I must. If any fellow gets above me in the class, I will not complain or attempt to pull him down. If the fellows think I am fit to be a sergeant or a captain or a corporal, I shall abide their decision. I won't pull any fellow down, or be pulled down myself." I think the regulators are a mean, dirty, cowardly set of bullies, who mean to build themselves up by pulling others down. Let every fellow be judged by his own merits. That's my opinion. Now you can do what you please. And they did do what they pleased, though it was evident the regulators were not accustomed to deal with so stubborn a subject. At the word from Kennedy, who seemed to be the chief of the society, the whole band fell upon Richard with sticks which they had cut in the woods, and gave him a most unmerciful beating. 
the prisoner bore it with silent disdain he felt that the cause in which he was engaged was a good one and he did not flinch from the penalty of fidelity at the word from the chief they suspended the flagellation and kennedy again attempted to bring him to terms by argument but it was in vain very well said he evidently disappointed at the ill success of the reasoning process this is only the first installment of what is your due when anything goes wrong with you when you get into a scrape when you find the ushers and the colonel down upon you just understand that the regulators are round you have fifty enemies now instead of one as you had two hours ago that's all kennedy don't say any more interposed dobbin impatiently let's take him back now he will find out the rest of it fast enough if richard could have heard the conversation among the regulators before they waited upon him he might have been flattered by the complimentary manner in which his name was handled his talents and his muscle no less than his growing popularity were appreciated by the band and it was more desirable to win him than it was to drive him out they knew what a valuable acquisition he would be to their number but he must stand one side and wait for his turn before he aspired to become a leader the regulators using the utmost caution unloosed the prisoner and marched him back to the camp when they reached the line they threw him upon the ground while one of the largest of them having all the advantage held him there the others disappeared in the darkness the fellow that held him then removed the strap from the arms of the captive and bounded away as fast as his legs would carry him richard jumped up as quick as he could and gave chase but the regulator had the start of him and the pursuit was useless the victim returned to his beat felt round upon the ground till he found his gun picked it up and resumed his solitary walk he was a little confused by the events which had transpired and he was forced to acknowledge that the regulators had managed their business with consummate address and skill he hardly knew what to make of the affair he knew that he had been whipped this fact was still patent to his consciousness in the tingling sensation that played over his legs the whole thing seemed very much like an illusion it was almost too strange and ridiculous to be credited and he could not help considering whether he had not actually been walking in his sleep this time the regulators appeared to his sober senses to be the most absurd institution ever invented by the mischievous brain of a boy yet he could not disbelieve the evidence of his senses and especially of his smarting legs and he was compelled to admit that the society actually existed though there was a remote possibility that the whole affair was a practical joke devised by nevers and his clique we have before intimated in the course of this story that richard grant was an old head he had a very tolerable conception of the principles of strategy therefore he did not do as most boys would have done make a tremendous row over the occurrences of the night he decided that it would be politic for him to keep both eyes and both ears open while he kept his mouth closed by this course he hoped to obtain a clue to the mystery and thus eventually to make the daylight shine in upon the dark proceedings of the regulators where have you been this hour demanded the sentinel whose beat was next to his own when they met i haven't been far off replied richard that is not more than half a mile off he added in a tone so low that his companion could not hear him i understand you have been taking a nap upon my word i haven't but you have i haven't seen you before for an hour i haven't been asleep honor bright grant haven't you asked his companion good-naturedly no i haven't where were you when the grand rounds were made i was close by of course you were or you would have been missed added his neighbor as he turned on his heel and made off richard thought he was very easily satisfied and he wondered if he wasn't a member of the secret band of regulators our sentinel marched to the other end of his beat his neighbor on this side had missed him but he was as easily satisfied as the other had been and richard wondered whether he was not a regulator while he was musing upon the extraordinary events of the night the relief came round and he was marched to the guard tent where for four hours he had an opportunity to dream of the regulators and their secret management of the affairs of the tunbrook institute End of chapter 15 
Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana. Chapter 16 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Richard Becomes First Sergeant of Company D. The next morning, Richard was discharged from guard duty and returned to the battalion. From the moment he opened his eyes, he carefully observed the actions of his companions, and even studied the glances which were bestowed upon him. All of his watching seemed to be in vain, for he could not obtain a particle of information that would aid him in solving the mystery of the regulators. Among the boys there were several with whom he had become quite intimate, particularly Bailey, who occupied the next bed to his in Barrack B. So eager was he to fathom the mystery that he was tempted to make some inquiries of them. But they might themselves be members of the regulators. Even Bailey might belong to the potent organization, and he did not care to expose himself in the slightest degree to their jeers or their malice. Though, as he had been informed, there were fifty boys who had become his enemies and who were pledged to annoy him to the utmost of their ability, Every one seemed to be his friend. Hardly had he been discharged from guard duty before his arrest was ordered, and he found himself accused of sleeping at his post. He was conducted to the tent of Colonel Brockridge, where the charge was distinctly recited to him. "'What do you say to this charge, Grant? Are you guilty or not guilty?' demanded the principal. "'Who are my accusers, sir?' asked Richard, thinking only of the task he had laid upon himself of discovering the regulators. That does not answer my question, Grant. I asked you whether you were guilty or not guilty, added the colonel sternly. Not guilty, sir, replied Richard, promptly and firmly. Then you wish to have the charge proved? I do, sir. That is rather inconvenient, said the colonel, biting his lip. If you are guilty, I should prefer to have you say so. I am not guilty, sir. Colonel Brockridge had had too much experience with boys to neglect the looks and actions of the accused while he questioned him. For the expression often reveals more than the words. Richard's communication on this occasion was, yea, yea, nay, nay. He had the look of one who speaks the truth, and the principal was duly impressed by the appearance and manner of the prisoner. You speak very decidedly, added the colonel. Were you at your post at half-past nine o'clock? I was not, sir. Where were you? Richard hesitated. There were several teachers and several company officers present. He did not like to tell the story before them, and he did not think it would be prudent to do so. Probably some of the regulators were within hearing, and he preferred to unearth them in some other way. Your answer, Grant, said the principal. Without intending any disrespect to you, sir, I would rather not answer, replied Richard, glancing at the officers present. A slight curl on the lip of a cadet by the name of Redman attracted his attention. It was a kind of suppressed sneer which Richard interpreted that he dared not expose the doings of the secret society. His answer had been a virtual admission of the charge, and the case seemed to have gone against him. Richard concluded that the boy who could rejoice at that moment must be a regulator. The penalty of sleeping at your post and deserting it would be the same, and as you admit the charge in substance, it will not be necessary to proceed any further, said Colonel Brockridge. Richard was tempted to make a full explanation of the events of the night, but he had some doubts whether he would be believed if he did so. Besides, he was curious to know what the regulators would do. The penalty for the offense with which he was charged could not be very heavy, and he determined to submit to it, for the purpose of exposing the regulators at some future time. The principal then gave him a lecture on the impropriety of deserting his post when placed on guard, explaining the consequences that might result from such unfaithfulness in time of war. Richard listened patiently to the reproof, and was sentenced to be confined in the guard tent for twenty-four hours. Richard possessed his soul in patience, and slept off a good portion of his imprisonment. 
he devoted all his wakeful hours to a consideration of the doings of the regulators, and in devising plans for ventilating their secret proceedings. When he was relieved from arrest and permitted to join his comrades, he kept a close watch upon Redmond, and also upon the two privates who had been next to him in the line on guard. They must have been his accusers, and he was satisfied that they belonged to the obnoxious association. Nevers, no doubt, was also a member, and he believed him to be the Dobbin of the party that had whipped him. Here were four whom he suspected, and during the week the battalion remained in camp. Their words and their actions were carefully scanned, but they were too adroit to expose themselves, though Richard's close scrutiny was not entirely fruitless. Our soldier entered heartily into the spirit of the occasion, and performed his duty with the utmost fidelity. Though he was made the victim of various petty tricks, such as smearing the stock of his musket with grease, cutting the straps of his knapsack, and hiding his blanket, he bore all these things with politic patience, and treated his comrades with the most scrupulous fairness. He was the champion of the weak, and— being the conqueror of Nevers, no one ventured to carry their opposition to his will beyond a few respectful words. He would not let a small boy be insulted or bullied, and a frown from him was generally a sufficient protection. He was foremost in all the sports of the boys, and every day increased his popularity. If the regulators said or did anything to his injury, they did it very slyly, for Richard could not discover that there was any one who was not his friend. On the last day of the encampment, the election of officers was to take place, and during the week, of course, there was a great deal of electioneering done for various candidates. On the day before the election, a petition was circulated among the boys, requesting the principal to reinstate Nevers in the office from which he had been degraded. There were about fifty names on the paper when Bailey brought it to Richard. It was not very favorably received by the boys generally. Nobody could tell when or where the fifty names had been obtained. No one had seen the signers place their autographs upon the document. Richard heard Bailey and a dozen others refuse to sign it, and some of them even proposed to get up a remonstrance. "'I am going to sign the petition,' said Richard, to the astonishment of his companions." "'You, Grant?' exclaimed a dozen boys in the same breath. "'I am, just to show the fellows that I bear him no ill will,' replied Richard. "'Nevers was degraded for that affair with me, and, as I licked him, I think I can afford to do the handsome thing.' "'Then he will be elected captain of Company D,' said Bailey. "'I don't know about that,' added Richard. "'I am willing to see him restored to the place he was in before I came.' but i shall not give him my vote for captain or anything else the victim of the regulators took out his pencil and wrote his name upon the petition though he fully believed that nevers was the dobbin of the party that had assaulted him he could not prove it and he was disposed to give him a fair chance so that neither he nor his friends should have any good ground for complaint his example was followed by all the boys present and from that moment the number of names on the paper increased very rapidly. At a dress parade, Colonel Brockridge, to whom the petition had been presented earlier in the afternoon, called Nevers forward, and after a few remarks, restored him to his former position as first sergeant of Company D, observing at the same time that the name of Richard Grant on the paper had had more influence upon his mind than that of all the others. It was a magnanimous act which he heartily approved. Three cheers for Nevers!' shouted some friend of the first sergeant, when the company broke ranks. They were given, but it was only a partial demonstration, evidently confined to about a dozen of the company. Three cheers for Grant!' said Bailey, when those for the first sergeant had been given. The call was promptly responded to, and though the cheers seemed to proceed from the entire company, there were probably about a dozen who did not join. "'Tiger!' added Bailey, with an earnestness that assured Richard he was not a member of the regulators. The tiger was added, together with a volley of applause by clapping the hands. 
Richard's position in Company D was not to be doubted, and the regulators present must have felt that their influence was not very powerful. On the following day, they had a further proof of the popularity of Richard, and if they had not been very stupid, they might have seen that he had more influence than the whole band of regulators put together. On the first ballot in Company D, the first lieutenant was elected captain. The second sergeant was elected first lieutenant. The second lieutenant was believed to be a strong friend of Nevers, and no promotion was awarded to him. Richard Grant was elected second sergeant, and when the vote was declared, the result was greeted with a round of hearty applause. The other places were all filled, as the inclination of the majority dictated, subject only to the healthy rules of the institution. If there had been no limit to the choice of the boys, we have no doubt their favorite would have been elected captain. The face of Nevers was as dark as a thundercloud after the election. The remark of Richard that he would not vote for him had been circulated through the company, and had been influential in defeating the aspirations of the first sergeant. Nevers knew very well that he owed his defeat, and his restoration, to his rival, whom he hated with tenfold greater vigor than before. Hated him for what he had done, and hated him for what he had left undone. Of course, Richard felt very good-natured, and snapped his fingers at the regulators. He sat upon a stool alone after supper, thinking of his good fortune, and congratulating himself upon the skill with which he had conquered his enemies. He was satisfied that in being true to himself, he had won the respect and confidence of his companions. The good resolutions he had successfully carried out had rendered him worthy of the favor bestowed upon him. In conquering himself, he had conquered others. While Richard sat on the stool thinking of the pleasant events of the day, and perhaps wondering how long it would be before he became the major of the battalion, his vanquished rival sauntered up to him, his face still looking dark and malignant. "'You have beaten me again, Grant,' said he sourly, "'but your day will come soon.' "'Eh, Dobbin?' replied Richard, with a good-natured smile, as he glanced at his fellow-sergeant. "'What's that?' growled Nevers. "'What do you mean by calling me Dobbin?' Richard was satisfied from the appearance of Nevers that the name was not wholly unfamiliar to his ears. It was the first time he had ever ventured to hint at the proceedings of his first night in camp, and it was the first time that his rival had ever dared to speak to him in a surly tone. "'If you don't understand it, no matter,' added Richard, with a merry twinkle of the eye. If you call me by that, or any other improper name, you shall suffer for it. How many of you will it take to punish me for it, eh, Dobbin? Dobbin again? Do you know a fellow by the name of Kennedy? added Richard. If you don't, I'll introduce you some day. Nevers concluded that Richard was a tough customer, and he made no further allusion to any suffering in store for his defiant rival. But Richard's taunt about Kennedy— and his promises to introduce him were not pleasant to the bully, and he walked away. He feared that the victim had been making dangerous discoveries. On the following morning the battalion took up the line of march for the Institute, and arrived without incident or accident, and that night the boys exchanged the hard ground for the iron bedsteads in the barracks. End of chapter 16 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 17 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Richard Gives the Tunbrookers a Lesson in Boating. Among the favorite recreations of the cadets of the Tunbrook Military Institute was that of boating. The beautiful lake afforded them abundant space for sailing and rowing, and quite a number of them were proficient oarsmen and excellent navigators. On the Saturday afternoon, following the return from the camp, Colonel Brockridge proposed to exercise the boys in the boats. This announcement was received with hearty applause by the cadets, and they gathered round the principal to learn the order of exercises upon the lake. "'Well, boys,' 
suppose we appoint a couple of coxswains and have a race hooray shouted the boys a race a race you like the plan i see who shall be your leaders added the colonel the boys made no reply but looked curiously at each other as though they were not competent to settle the question nevers for one said redmond very well nevers we all know is a good boatman and has always won the races who shall be the other no reply was made and the principal waited some time for a suggestion grant has had considerable experience with boats his father informed me continued colonel brockridge grant grant shouted the boys grant shall be coxswain of the other boat then what do you say grant i am very willing sir if the fellows desire it replied richard modestly very well the race shall come off at four o'clock each leader shall have two hours to train his crew the course shall be round green island and home making a pull of about three miles you shall draw lots for the choice of boats though i don't think there is a particle of difference between them the choice was between the alice and the emma as the two club boats had been named nevers drew the first choice and selected the alice and of course richard was obliged to be satisfied with the emma the coxswains shall select their own crews now draw for the first choice nevers drew the prize this time also and named redmond as his stroke oarsman richard took bailey for the same station and they continued to select alternately till each had taken his twelve oarsmen the coxswain of the alice had a decided advantage over his rival for he had a complete knowledge of the capacity of each boy and had before taken part in several races on the lake richard was aided in choosing by his friends whom he had selected and when they stepped into the boat he was well satisfied with his crew we shall get beaten said bailey in a low tone as they shoved off the emma what makes you think so bailey demanded richard with a smile nevers is a great boatman he knows all about a boat and when he was in command he always won the race don't you croak bailey laughed richard i have seen a boat before to-day and i tell you we shall not get beaten the coxswain spoke in a loud tone so that all his crew could hear him for he knew that the first requisite of success was confidence i hope so said bailey i would rather any other fellow in the school should beat you than nevers it will be a feather in his cap don't croak bailey just believe that we shall beat and we shall i hope we shall nevers first got ahead of all the fellows in boating his success elected him to his first office in the company and if he beats you in this race he will be captain at the next election the boys will all stand by the fellow that beats in anything there bailey if you say another word i shall wish i had chosen some other fellow you will defeat us if you keep on croaking added the coxswain earnestly i'm not croaking i only want you to understand what you have got to do and i will do all i can to help you win the race what are you going up here for demanded bailey as the boat's bow was pointed down the river which was the outlet of the lake you ask too many questions bailey if you will leave this thing to me i will agree to whip nevers all to pieces said richard who did not like the discipline on board the emma all right grant let him alone bailey said one of the boys in the middle of the boat where's the other boat asked richard i see her she has gone up the lake that's just what i wanted her to do i have a little business to do here before we go into the race he ordered the crew to cease rowing and to the surprise of his companions ran the boat up to the shore as he had intimated to them that questions were not agreeable to him they asked none and waited patiently till his movements should explain themselves now bailey will you go up to the storehouse and bring down some black lead and the brushes they use to clean the stoves don't let anybody see you and don't say a word to any one bailey did not very clearly understand what this request had to do with winning the race but he ran off with all haste to execute the mission entrusted to him while he was gone richard improved the opportunity to develop his system of rowing to his companions he had attended a great many boat races on the hudson had belonged to a boat club in whitestone 
and had clear ideas upon all matters connected with the business of boating. On the return of the messenger, the articles he had brought were thrown into the stern sheets, and the boat shoved off. Again, to the surprise of the crew, Richard took them down the river half a mile, till they came to a sandy shore where he grounded the Emma. "'Now tumble out, fellows,' said Richard, "'and take your oars with you.' The boys wondered more than before at the singular proceedings of the coxswain, and Bailey so far overcame his request for discipline again as to suggest that they should have no time to practice with the oars if they spent the precious moments in this stupid manner. "'Shut up, Bailey. I have more to lose in this race than you have,' said Richard rather curtly. "'If the fellows don't believe in me for this business, I am willing to step one side and let any other one take hold who thinks he can do it better than I can.' "'Go ahead, Grant,' shouted the crew. "'We are all satisfied, and so is Bailey.' "'I won't speak another word, Grant,' said Bailey. "'I only wish I had as much confidence as you have.' "'Bear a hand lively, my lads,' added Richard, as he seized the painter of the boat. "'I want to get her out of the water.' The boys took hold with a will, and the Emma was soon placed high and dry upon the beach. She was then turned over. "'There, fellows,' said Richard, as he pointed to the foul bottom of the boat. "'Do you expect to win a race with the craft in that condition? "'In fifteen minutes we will have her in the water again, as clean as a lady's parlor.' By direction of the coxswain, the crew fell to scrubbing the bottom of the boat with an earnestness and zeal which soon removed every trace of moss and grass. She was then permitted to dry for a short time, and the bright October sun soon completed their work. The bottom was then covered over with black lead, and rubbed with the brushes till it shone like a newly polished stove. The boys used their muscle upon the brushes, being relieved every minute by fresh hands. "'Now, my lads, we are in condition to win the race. Shove her off,' said Richard, whose energy inspired the whole party with resolution and confidence." The Emma was afloat again. The boys took their places, though not till Richard had rearranged them by their weight, so that the boat was in perfect trim when she started. For an hour and a half Richard trained them in rowing, till the stroke exactly suited him, and they fully understood all his signs and signals. "'Now, fellows, mind your eyes, and we are sure to win,' said the wide-awake coxswain, as the gun fired that was to call them to the stake boat. I never saw a better set of rowers in my life, and I am as well satisfied with you as though we had been pulling together for a year. Bully for you, Grant, said one of the boys at the bow. The Emma pulled leisurely up to the large sailboat, on board of which were the colonel, the assistant teachers, and as many of the boys as she would comfortably accommodate. Are you all ready? shouted the colonel, as the Alice and the Emma took their stations. "'All ready, sir,' replied Richard cheerfully. "'All ready, sir,' added Nevers confidently. Both parties were impatient for the contest to begin, and both were almost certain of winning the victory. Even the boats seemed to share in the spirit of their crews, and anxious to have the fetters removed that they might bound away upon the errand of conquest. Each had appropriate flags at the bow and stern, and one with a taste for boats would have been delighted by the appearance of the trim craft. "'Ready for the signal!' shouted the colonel again. "'Down with that flag in the bow, Carter,' said Richard to the bowman, as he took down the colour in the stern. "'What's that for?' asked one of the crew of the Emma. "'They hold the wind, and keep us back a little. We will be on the safe side. Now, ready, fellows, and mind what I have said to you.' Don't look at the other boat till you can see her over our stern. Nevers disdained to follow the example of his rival in removing his flags, saying that he could beat him with his colors flying. Nevers prided himself upon his skill in handling a boat, and he felt that the opportunity had come which would enable him to triumph over the hated usurper, as he considered Richard. He knew how much glory and honor would be awarded to the conqueror in this race, and that if he could beat his rival, scores of those fair-weather friends who always attach themselves to a rising man would leave him. The signal gun was on shore, and at a gesture from the colonel it was discharged. The report seemed to unloose the bounds which chained the boats to their stations, and they bounded away, 
the crew of the alice bent to their oars with the most tremendous energy while that of the emma seemed to be inspired by the cool and steady nerve of her coxswain they had been fully and thoroughly instructed in their duty the crowd of boys on the shore were silent and breathless with the interest they felt in the exciting race and when before the boats had gone a quarter of a mile they discovered the alice more than half a length ahead of her companion the jaws of richard's friends dropped and their faces were as long as though a ten-pound weight had been fastened to the chin of each while a smile of triumphant satisfaction lighted up the faces of nevers's well-wishers nevers has it exclaimed one of his intimates as when she rounded green island the alice was found to be more than a length ahead of the emma not yet said one of the other clique let dick grant alone he knows what he is about he don't half try yet the crew of the emma could not yet see the alice over the stern of the boat and we doubt not they shared the anxiety and despondency of their friends on shore but no sooner had the boats rounded the island and commenced on the home stretch than richard's vibrating body began gradually to move more rapidly and just in proportion as he increased the movement the emma lessened the distance between herself and the alice steady fellows don't get excited dip a little deeper said richard in a quiet cool tone we are doing splendidly and you shall see the alice over the stern in about three minutes nevers as in the fight with his rival began to be very much excited when he saw that he was losing ground he spoke quick and earnest words to the crew of his boat who had been doing their utmost from the beginning urging them to increase their exertions richard had not permitted his crew to do their best at first but had kept in their muscles a reserve of strength for the final emergency the party in the alice had no such reserve power and their efforts to increase the speed of the boat were put forth at the expense of a proper attention to skill and precision the boats were now side by side and they continued in this relative position until they were within half a mile of the stake boat the race had become intensely exciting and again the two cliques on shore were breathless and silent with interest neither party had anything to indicate the success of its favorite even yet richard had not put his crew to their utmost but the decisive moment had arrived and his body began to sway backward and forward with increasing rapidity and a quarter of a mile more gave him half a boat length's advantage over his rival steady fellows keep cool said he in a loud whisper don't miss a stroke and make every one tell all it will now you will see her over the stern but pull steady the emma was a length ahead of the alice when richard finished these remarks the boats were within an eighth of a mile of the end of the course and the murmuring applause of the grant party on shore began to reach the ears of the contestants pull pull shouted nevers filled with rage and vexation pull with all your might fellows we can beat him yet if you only stick to it he increased the rapidity of his motions but his crew were unable to keep up with him their stroke was unsteady some of them forgot to feather their oars and some scarcely dipped the blades in the water steady said richard with more energy mind your stroke keep both eyes on me here we are shouted he jumping up from his seat in the stern and giving the order to cease rowing the emma flew by the stake boat two and a half lengths ahead of the alice and a stunning roar of cheers from the shore and the sailboat saluted the victors grant forever three cheers for grant shouted bailey as the crew of the emma rose and made the welking ring with their huzzas End of chapter seventeen recording by scarlet louisiana